not to pick on Magnus Carlsen, but another commentary video from the World Blitz Chess Championship, another Magnus Carlsen loss. The moves were played quickly, and what we see here is sort of an unorthodox um, queen's pawn game employed by Rajabov, and Carlsen decides that's that's enough of an excuse for him to get aggressive out of the opening, plays c5, bishop e2, and we're headed toward a little bit of a typical structure in that uh, we're likely either going to get an isolated queen pawn or a hanging pawn structure. After knight bd d2, Carlsen Fianchetto's, rather than keeping the bishop on this diagonal, really a heads-up play, honestly, because the bishop is so much better here targeting the d-pawn. After bishop d3, bishop to g7, castles, we see the position we have on the board, and Carlsen Rekarovka's as well. Rook to c1 is played pretty quickly by Rajabov, and Carlsen takes a moment to think because he's not sure how he wants to approach the central structure. Does he want to take now and invite the hanging pawn position, knowing that dynamically white will have a little bit of a space advantage, but then he has targets long-term to focus on? Does he want to take some other approach, maybe developing a little more passively and leaving the tension for a while? It's a critical decision, but ultimately one he decides is, is one that is left for a better day with b6, because by putting the bishop on b7, he gets a little bit more prepared to deal with this coming hanging pawn structure. Double fianchettos are usually pretty good to deal with hanging pawn structures, because the bishops are coming at the diagonals from both sides of the board. And again, what you want in those structures, white's going to want to keep the minor pieces on the board at least until the pawns can do something tricky and nasty. Whereas black is going to look to improve the knight likely from c6 to either a5 or sometimes f5 to open up diagonals and to increase pressure. And we're going to look for the dynamic tension to build until something happens with these pawns in the center. Rajabov decides it's good to just put rooks on open files. Hey, everybody knows that. Bishop to b7 and then a3 is runs into rook to c8. Everybody's sort of just staring at the tension here, right? It's like a game of chicken where Kevin Bacon gets his shoelace caught in the uh, tractor, which ultimately proves that he wins the girl. Moral of the story, don't get caught with your shoelace in a tractor. Now, uh, after rook to c8, the problem for developing your pieces when there's pawn tension still in the center is you have to know where you want them long term. Like you can't just put the queen on c2 if that ends up meaning that the c file is critical. So Rajabov is trying to anticipate what's going to happen with the structure before playing queen to e2, which creates a concrete threat, perhaps to take on d5 and then gobble up the a6 pawn. Carlson decides he can no longer sit around and wait and uh, must do something in the center before white gets everything he wants takes on c4. We get the hanging pawn structure we've been foreshadowing this whole time. Makes sense for white. And now both sides will have to think about where they want their pieces to deal with this. The hanging pawn structure is, is instructive in many ways. It's very dynamic. Both sides want different things. White has a space advantage and wants to keep it that way. Black wants to look for the right way to get the pieces hitting the pawns because, as we said, they're hanging. They can only be supported by pieces. No longer can they be supported by pawns. And that makes them positional targets for the rest of the game. Now, Rajabov is going to think here. He's not exactly sure what to do, so he plays a high-class waiting move, a move that frees a back rank for future problems, maybe takes away the g4 square. Who knows? Maybe he's going to play g4 if he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed next day. Black plays queen to c7, clearing the way for the d-file. Queen d7 is also an option, and white plays queen e3. Knight e7 comes. That knight's headed to f5, as we foreshadowed. Coming this way is usually also an option. But after knight e5... Excuse me, we don't see 95 just yet. There goes Carlson catches up with us, right? Hey, Magnus, speed up a little bit for us, buddy. We're making a video here. White plays... Well, after knight f5, white has to think about it because it's a critical moment. Do I want to leave this knight hitting my weakest pawn on the board, or do I part with the bishop pair? Nobody's ever happy to part with the bishop pair, just ask Stockfish. But um, ultimately, I think it's decided correctly by Rajabov that this knight hitting the d-pawn is going to create too many tactical problems. And you'll notice that he decides with the aforementioned option to part with the bishop pair. The only other option that might have been considered was queen f4, but okay, we're not going to have time to analyze that. He takes, e takes. Structurally, from a structural perspective, we favor white with the past d-pawn and black's double pawns, but again, black has this monster of a bishop over here on b7, and things things are going to get real here in just a minute if, uh, if white isn't careful about the tactics on the diagonal. This felt like a game that was headed the direction for Carlsen, as, uh, as usual, but after things get messy here, you'll see that critical opportunities are missed. Knight d to f3 makes sense. It's a solid move that re-coordinates the ponies, brings them back to where they like where they like it, protecting each other. And uh, Carlson decides the bishop pair will no longer be of value to him. He wants to take on f3 so that he can put this knight into e4. Not exactly sure it's the most uh, 
the best decision in the, from the bigger picture perspective, but the position is probably just about equal, and uh, both sides still having plenty to play for, similarly to what we've been saying they're playing for. Black wants to gang up on these weak hanging pawns, and, and white wants to keep the dynamic tension, in the because as long as the pawns stay together, they're also restricting black's pieces, correct? So yes, they're weak, but they're also an asset. That's the funny thing about hanging pawns. Black played queen to d6, and now Rajalov slides over, creating tactical tension, and believe me, everybody, it's about to get real. Bishop takes e5 was played because Carlson was afraid of tactics on f7. And uh, in this position, after queen to c6, we had queen to e3, and then the rook comes over to d8. It looks like things are headed the favoring of black with a strong knight on e4 and the rook's recoordinated. But don't forget that long-term weaknesses aren't going anywhere. Grab a Snickers. These dark squares may end up being a problem if this pawn ever gets out of the way. Rajabov thinks similarly, so he plays f3. Maybe by getting rid of the knight, I can prepare opportunities to push. After playing e6, he says it's worth a, it's worth a pawn for sure if I can just open up the dark square diagonal. Time to go to sack town. He'd love to put the queen on e5 or c3 or even h6, and Carlson has to think. Remember, this is blitz, everybody. Not a lot of time to make sense of these tactics. What we will do in a moment is back up and talk about a critical moment that Rajabov maybe be, maybe missed, but uh, in the current position, Carlson is still thinking. Didn't quite jump in with the pony yet. Again, if knight takes, you have to deal with ideas like queen to e5. If rook takes, you have to deal with ideas like queen to h6 or queen to c3 are both very dangerous. Pawn takes would be a mess as well because now you really have long-term problems on the dark squares. After thinking for a long time, you'll, you'll just be ready for the fact that Carlson jumps into the square on d3 with the pony, maybe preparing originally to get rid of the dark square bishop and make a trade. But uh, with, with, with a little bit of a messy, messy uh, mess of it in terms of what he calculated, it's where the game ultimately unravels. Knight to d3 is finally played. Rajabov is thinking, he's thinking, he's thinking, I look like John Lennon. I look like the, uh, the, the top chess player from the band The Beatles. If any top chess player looks like someone from the band from The Beatles, it's me. I think I look like John Lennon. That's exactly what he was thinking there that whole time, believe me. After rook to d1, we are waiting for black to come up with the correct move that unfortunately Carlson does not. He plays a move that you'll find was the right square, wrong piece. The correct move for black was f4, exclam of Iach, and after queen to e4, trading queens would have eliminated the chances for white to win on the dark squares and ultimately head to a drawn ending. However, Carlson does not go for that, and instead he played knight f4. As we said, good square, wrong piece. Looks fancy with the tactics, but after rook e1, rook takes d1, and taking e6, we're going we're gonna to find that uh, white has too much on the dark squares. The best, the, the best and last chance for black before we get to this knight takes e6 blunder was the move queen to c5 trading queens. He just underestimated how dangerous white's attack was, to be completely frank about it, and uh, needed, needed to get the queens off the board in a hurry. He didn't. He played the move knight takes e6, and after queen to c3, f6, all of a sudden it becomes very clear what's going on, and actually white's attack is just out of control. Rook to f8 is played. Desperation time. The queen's going to go gobbling pawns, and with a couple of forcing checks... We're going to find that Carlson's position is simply simply not a holdable holdable mess. King to h1, nothing like a nice, strong, prophylactic move when, when you're on the attack. Queen takes c4, bishop e5. The king is in a little bit of a net. Carlson's down on time, plays rook f7, but that's not enough. After bishop d6, check king e8, and queen over, pieces will be lost. It's only a matter of time. Bishop takes f8. If rook takes, by the way, the queen hangs. Carlson plays one last desperate move, but bishop to b4, discovered check, is mate in the next move. Now, as we said, the critical moment for Carlson was perhaps playing the move f4 instead of the move knight to f4. Would have held. Of course, he had one last chance trying to bail out into the endgame. But fun fact, because we love to learn around here, this is, this is a video for chess.com after all, right? Is that back in this position here, as much as I liked this tactic and talked about the pressure it was bringing and ultimately it made Carlson part with the dark squares, Rajabov had a tactic of his own right here. If you want to pause the video, we are under 10 minutes, which is a magic mark for me. Hey, I never finish a video in under 10 minutes, so I'm real proud. You can pause the video and see what Rajabov could have played. No, you don't want to? Okay, I'll show you. Rook takes e4 was the move that maybe would have won on the spot. F takes is met by things like queen takes f7, but even f6 would have allowed c5 followed by a sliding of the queen and the move d5. Yes, is this really tricky to see? Yes, would have been probably impossible to solve all of this in a blitz game? Yes, but we love tactics as we said and we love the idea that past pawns end up being victorious. You know why? Because who doesn't love an underdog story? Thank you everybody for watching and uh, subscribe to us everywhere. This is chess.com. Appreciate, appreciate the support.